Hello and welcome. Today I am going to be talking about genetics, in particular about DNA molecular history and some of the classical experiments that led to our understanding about how DNA operates and the structure of DNA so that we could then infer genetics and how those factors or genes are essentially then passed from parents to offspring. So we're going to start with Frederick Griffith's experiment. Frederick Griffith in the 1920s, almost very similar to today, uh, there were lots of cases of pneumonia, uh, many that were caused by the 1918 flu pandemic, but um, also because we did not have antibiotics uh, back in the 1920s. So one thing that he thought was interesting and that he noted was that some people were able to recover uh, from their pneumonia infections while others were not able to. So he really then had the question as to what makes some bacteria that cause pneumonia virulent or deadly and what make some non-virulent. So he studied two different types of pneumonia bacteria, the R variety uh, for the rough. <clears throat> so the R strain of pneumonia, um, if injected into the subject, the test subject here of a mouse, caused the mouse to get sick, but then to recover from that pneumonia. Um, this one then had a different outer membrane covering to that bacteria cell. The S variety, um, it had a lipopolysaccharide covering, which made it look smooth underneath of a microscope. When injected into the test mouse, the mouse got sick and the mouse was not able to recover from that form of the bacteria, the S bacteria. So what Frederick Griffith then did was he <clears throat> took the heat or he took heat to kill the S bacteria. Um, heated to a certain temperature. Uh, as you can imagine, the bacteria were not able to withstand that. They then died. Uh, then the dead heat-killed bacteria injected into the mouse didn't even cause any sickness into the mouse, and the mouse was able to continue living. Then results that he got were not quite expected. He mixed together a living R strain and a heat-killed S strain bacteria, both of them on their own do not cause death to the mouse, but when mixed together and injected into the mouse, the mouse ended up dying and succumbing to that pneumonia infection. So Griffith's conclusion here was that a process of transformation happened, that the, the harmless R bacteria were somehow transformed by some factor um, that was given to it from the S bacteria. Picking up on Griffith's experiment, Oswald Avery modified his experiment uh, to gather some evidence to support um, what would be that transforming factor. So common assumptions, uh, hypotheses as to what that transforming factor was in the 1920s um, would have either been some type of nucleic acid, RNA or DNA, or protein, uh, both of which you are going to find in varying varieties uh, between species. So you can find many different proteins expressed in different species and a different arrangement of nucleotide bases in other species. <clears throat> so what he did was he used enzymes to destroy each one of those individually. So again, in a controlled experiment, you were only controlling or changing one variable. So he added proteases. Proteases destroy protein. They're going to break them down. Um, he used nucleases, both an RNA ACE and a DNA ACE to break down those macromolecules um, in different samples of the heat-killed S bacteria. And then he predicted the outcome. So what he was able to find then with his experiment was that if he had proteases and the sample contained no protein, then transformation still occurred. If he added a ribonuclease to destroy the RNA, and you now have no RNA, then transformation again still occurred. And it wasn't until he added the DNA ACE or deoxyribonuclease that destroyed the DNA that transformation did not happen.
So this provided significant evidence that it is DNA that is the transforming factor and that it is the source of heredity in which how information can be passed from parent to offspring or in this case bacteria cell to bacteria cell via horizontal gene transfer. Again, to, to really add supporting evidence to the <clears throat> hypothesis that DNA is the transforming factor, Hershey and Chase um, in the late 1940s, uh, early 1950s, picked up on these experiments. And what they used was they used a bacteriophage that would infect these bacteria cells so they wanted to show that it was something else, not just bacteria, that actually used DNA as this unit of heredity. So in order for viruses to make more viruses, what was that factor that they used? So Hershey and Chase used radioactivity in order to be able to figure out which molecule was in these bacteria cells. Because so we think of DNA and then protein, um, very small, uh, you can't really see it, but by using radioactive tags, it would be much easier to definitively tell if that substance was in these cells. So they labeled one bacteriophage with radioactive phosphorus, so P32, and they labeled another batch of bacteriophage with radioactive sulfur, um, S35. So if we think for a second, between, bacteria, between protein and DNA, which one has sulfur? And that's protein. And between DNA and protein, DNA is going to have phosphorus in that phosphate group of DNA. So this is also some, sometimes called the blender experiment because once the bacteriophages infected the bacteria, they broke up the bacteria cells and they were able to look at the supernatant fluid after um, involving a centrifuge to separate the different layers. And what they found was that there was um, really very little um, radioactive phosphorus in that supernatant liquid, uh, but there was a lot of sulfur in the supernatant liquid. But that wasn't really what they were looking for. They were most concerned by looking inside of the cells, what was found inside of these bacteria cells. And what they found was that there was radioactive phosphorus in the bacteria cells and that there was no radioactive sulfur in the bacteria cells. And this really then provided lots of definitive evidence that DNA is this unit of heredity and transforming factor. Here are just some examples of bacteriophages infecting bacteria cells. Phages are all around, and we did talk about phage therapy earlier in the year when we talked about antibiotic resistance. Um, next, so now that they understood really about the function of DNA, then next goal was to understand the structure of DNA. And a lot of what we now know of as the structure of DNA, we really should thank Rosalind Franklin for um, providing the evidence. So Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin worked in the same lab, although they were not friendly, and there's lots of interesting information or history that you could read about them. Um, but what Rosalind Franklin was incredibly gifted at is providing these X-ray crystallography images of DNA. And this is her famous image. This is photo 51. Um, what was the um, really insight that she had was that it formed this X-banding pattern. And from that expanding pattern, from her X-ray diffraction, so this is how this would happen. You have your crystallized DNA in this sample here. Um, then you have your X-ray, and it prevents or it presents then as an X-ray image on a photographic plate. Um, backing up here. So what did she do? She was able to uh, provide mathematical evidence then that DNA is double-stranded that the nitrogen bases need to be on the inside of those strands um, and that um, these DNA molecules then um, are going to be of uniform structure. So they're not going to um, be larger and smaller in some areas, but there's a uniform structure to them. So figuring out then the structure of DNA, well, 
if we know that they have to be uniform, then you can't have two purines together um, or two pyrimidines together because then that's going to cause this bellowing of the DNA molecule. So you need to have a purine and a pyrimidine mixed together. Uh, the purines are the two rings, and these are A and G, and the pyrimidines are the one nitrogen base ring, and those are uh, T and C. Providing other evidence then to support this base pairing is Chargoff's data. Erwin Chargoff studied DNA samples of many different organisms, and what he found was that the concentration of A almost always equaled the concentration of T, and same thing with C and G in any DNA sample that he was able to find. Um, so that provided evidence then for Watson and Crick that there's a double, there's a helical structure, there's a double helix, nitrogen bases are in the middle, and of even width. So they were the first then to construct this three-dimensional model of DNA. But again, they had lots of influence and lots of help from many different scientists. Uh, but what was important about their structure then was that it provided evidence for how it might actually replicate itself. So that A and T could only and ever bond together, your purine and pyrimidine. And then if you look at the number of hydrogen bonds, there's two hydrogen bonds that hold those together, which is why A cannot pair with C because there need to be three hydrogen bonds that hold um, these two bases, G and C, together. So in order to figure out how DNA replicates, there was really three different methods in which they thought that could happen. They thought that it could be semi-conservative, which should sound familiar. Uh, they thought that it could be conservative, where you keep one whole strand and you make and copy another one from it. Um, but you don't have a template strand, and disruptive, where you kind of broke up the DNA together and then it regrew those segments of DNA. Uh, Messels and Stahl, though, their experiment showed that it is semi-conservative replication. Uh, again, they used radioactive markers. They used a heavy nitrogen. So they used N14 and then the heavy version N15. And what they did was they started out with um, a sample of DNA that had N15, and they allowed for that to go through replication. And those two new strands then would all equ have e equal weight, but notice they are slightly lighter. And then to allow for replication to happen again, you have one strand serving as a template that has the light nitrogen and one strand serving as a template that has the heavy nitrogen. So then you ended up with two banding patterns. And as this happened and as this went on, it provides evidence that DNA replication is semi-conservative. And this then, for genetic sake, allows for organisms to pass on their genetic code um, pretty accurately. So with semi-conservative replication, it can happen fast, it can happen accurate, and therefore you can pass on those genes quickly to the next generation. Um, another classical experiment, uh, Nuremberg and Mathai, uh, what they were able to establish was that from that genetic code, it is going to be read the same exact way in all life. So DNA codes for RNA, which then ultimately codes for those amino acids to be linked together to make a protein. And this is the case for all life. Uh, the viral cells, bacteria cells, they all use the same sequence. Genetic code is read three letters at a time, um, and that RNA is going to be used with ribosomes to construct those proteins. And the same three letters of RNA code for the same amino acids no matter where um, on the life spectrum you are looking. Um, so their experiment involved... Um, different mutant varieties um, of bacteria that were able to or not able to make different amino acids. And they then were able to show that it was the exact same DNA pattern that always coded for the same amino acids. And then the last one on this PowerPoint is the PCR. So hopefully um, you know what PCR is. Um, we have talked about PCR before, but PCR is a way that we can actually use the process of what we know about DNA replication to make a lot of DNA. So um, 
recently uh, PCR was used, uh, is being used as a COVID-19 test analysis where you take this small sample of RNA and per, put it through a PCR process to make a lot of it. But PCR then has three basic processes. You take your small sample of DNA, you denature it, it breaks it apart, you anneal a primer to both of the template, now template strands of DNA, and then you allow for a polymerase, a DNA polymerase in this case, that will allow for high temperatures. So not your normal DNA polymerase, but one that would survive in higher temperatures to replicate that DNA. And by doing that, you can really focus on a particular region of DNA. So if this was to be used in, let's say, a crime sample, well, our DNA um, is very similar to one another, but there are those short tandem repeat sections that are highly variable that you could use PCR to make a lot of that different variety of DNA. Well, I hope that you all are having a great day. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask and I will talk to you later.